rites of passage. Daria, how would you describe a rite of passage? So the basic structure that my mentors have taught to me is that there's three components. The first is severance. Then you have your threshold um, or liminal space, and then you have incorporation. And every rite of passage, whether that's uh, just inevitably getting older through life, uh, it could be you know your day. Um, it could be life changes. It could also be, you know, more structural with plant medicines or survival trips, a vision quest. It could be learning a skill. You could have a rite of passage going through a skill. But every one of those cycles, people also call it the hero's journey. You're going to have repeating characteristics that allow you to go through that journey, that rite of passage, that and then have the outcome at the end. And so rites of passage, you know, in my experience, they're not easy. It's, there's, there's growing pains physically as we get older. Um, so let's, let's start off. How would, um, generalize here, what would the indigenous cultures of, you know, the world consider uh, what's a typical or non-typical rite of passage for an indigenous culture would you say give a few examples and then we'll talk about maybe things that we would see um, in our modern day society as rites of passage that people might not think about or they do think about yeah so i think uh in more of an indigenous or land-based culture you're going to get rites of passage that include you know your first hunt your first kill uh menstruation is going to be a rite of passage giving birth pregnancy is a rite of passage becoming a parent um, the sweat lodge a rite of pas passage the vision quest a rite of passage um, what might that look like say the first hunter the vision quest like dive down a little bit deeper to what just so people know what that actually looks like in the the the, per, the first person perspective of going through that so they know what you know what was considered the rite of passage of old compared to you know what it is now well, I think with those that I just mentioned, what you're going to get is this readiness from the community and also the person. The person is ready to embark on this. So it's not something that you're buying. It's not something that you're, you know, getting forced to do, which I'll talk about kind of modern day rite of passages that show up. But you're, there's a group readiness that, yeah, this person is ready for this rite of passage. So if we take the vision quest, um, that's generally a rite of passage that's done around your adolescence and there is a sense of maturity that is needed to embark on that. Some people are not ready till they're 25. Some people are ready when they're 16, 14. Um, and generally by the time that you're ready for your vision quest, you already have a foundation of all wilderness skills. So you are already gone through these mini rites of passage. You've probably slept outside, probably done walkabouts. And then now the group is saying, yes, you're ready. They're creating this container. The person is going off into their vision quest. And then the person is received as a group, as a new person. So that's the part of incorporation where the person is coming back to the, the community and people honor and value that threshold that they just crossed and is receiving that person as a new person um you know speaking of the hunt again you know the there's this journey of learning so of course that child is learning from their their aunt their uncles their their parents their community how to hunt and then at one day uh, at one day there's this severance that happens where it's like okay here's your whether it's a bow or a gun or however they're choosing to hunt and what they're hunting. And that person is going off to kill by themselves. So no longer having the help that was once there during the journey. And then they receive and celebrate that rite of passage for that person. So in modern day cultures, a rite of passage could be going to university. It could be getting a car. It could be buying a house. It could be having a kid. It could be getting married. Um, you see those as very common. It could be uh, a rite of passage could be, you know, making a certain uh, salary or a position in a job. And um, 
they show up in different ways. And I think I do see value in some of those pieces. So, you know, if you're trying to build up your position um, for your employment, I, I do see some similar attributes, but what's missing is this, this community, uh, this community awareness that that person is now almost like stepping up in maturity rather than it's just this solo journey of like, oh, I'm going to make more money versus there's no impact on the community of how the community is receiving you. So um, I, I, I'd like to touch on, I guess, and then have you kind of flow into it with your perspective, which is, I guess, a lot deeper than mine. Um, but some examples of um, rites of passage in ancient cultures and then kind of why they did these things and then you could kind of bleed into the modern day what we do now or what the recreation of those now and uh what we try to accomplish with that so uh, a famous example would be the spartan warriors so at a certain age the spartan mothers knew that their children would be taken away and begin uh in-depth military training so you know this could be regular hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat sometimes thrown out into the streets to survive and and get food whether that's stealing or you know uh whatever by whatever means possible they were kind of pitted into this dog eat dog world constantly um forced to fight and and be in survival mode for several years and this is what created a very warlike culture but also this gave them the ability to have such adept um, physically gifted warriors is this culture of pushing their limits and at that age what that did was it took the boy away from the mother and then it was a sign of okay you're no longer a child you've reached this stage of adolescence and now then you're going from this adolescence to a teenager uh, early adulthood and now you begin your training so um that's one example another example would be you know many indigenous cultures would have like a vision quest or a spirit animal journey where you know you were sent out into the wilderness and uh forced to fast from food and water until you had a a um let's uh say like a spiritual or hallucinogenic experience where you're visited by a spirit animal and you make a connection with this animal and you come back to the tribe to share that and if uh, a participant didn't come back have an experience they were cast out from the tribe because this was such an important part uh of their journey and it wasn't just you know um some people might say that's kind of silly but it wasn't it wasn't just go out there and hallucinate till you see an animal it was go out there and survive and rough we need to know that you're a capable member of society because in the hunter gatherer tribes there's no there's no use for uh, incapable people yes they would keep their indigenous elders and stuff and they would uh, they'd serve a purpose but the tribe had no use for a non-functioning member especially at that age they couldn't feed drag along and support that person another one like you said is the hunting so early on indigenous tribes it could be a solo hunting experience where they had to get a specific game or or face certain certain um, aspects of nature, whether it's a fast or a walkabout through the desert. It had to be something challenging that they knew, oh, if they went through this, we can respect them and know that they'll be able to withstand the harshest parts of our lifestyle and not, you know, murder someone in the tribe or, or cheat or steal or you know surrender or or betray them or it could be so many different things but they could count on that person after they've gone through this difficult experience to be a functioning strong member of the tribe so those are just a few examples and there's so many more mm -hmm. um i would yeah. say just based on what jeff said a difference between those types of rites of passage and then you know the more modern day ones is that I mentioned buying a car. So oftentimes you'll see people share and announce like, oh, I just bought this new car. I bought this new house. And that I would say that is a rite of passage for that person. It can feel really good Absolutely. to get 
And yet the difference that I see is that the house and the car are, are material possessions. They can be taken away. Fire, someone steals, I don't know, you're, you lose your vehicle. And yet when you're, when you're in a more land-based uh, embodiment kind of rite of passage, no one can take away those skills that you had to dig down and, and find in yourself. Uh, yeah, whether that's a physical skill or just uh, a resiliency skill and how you show up in the world, no one can take that away from you. It's not, it's not a material possession. And mm. those are, and you can't buy it and you can't buy it. And that, that is probably one of the biggest distinctions. Cause again, I'm not saying that there's no value to people you know, building up a business or making the first or making, million. Yeah. yeah. Or ma or buying a home or having a child, but there is a, a difference in the essence. And then there's a difference in how that sustains itself throughout your entire life. And oftentimes what I have seen is that in a true rite of passage, you're, you're only doing it once. Um, I would say a vision quest is a great example of that. I mean, of course, birth is a rite of passage and people have multiple births. So it's, it's all, you know, we're, we're not excluding situations, but I think something like the vision quest or plant medicines, what I see a lot is people that they, they're like, oh, I went on a vision quest and I'm going to do another vision quest and another vision quest and another one. Or they, they go to ayahuasca and then all of a sudden they're on their 10th ayahuasca trip and they haven't implemented the lessons from the from first, the first one. one so they're going back to like because they haven't got the answer they've been looking for in a consumptive form because you can't consume uh, a life-changing experience through a cup or through i guess you could in ayahuasca's case but you can't um you can't have that ex harrowing experience where it's you versus uh, the environment or, you know, this difficult, I guess, um, journey, hero's journey where you have to overcome and do all these things, uh, it often can't be bought. And that's where I think a lot of people struggle is they go for an ayahuasca trip with the wrong mindset and, and uh, thing about it where they it happens, it doesn't really change your life in any profound way. They might have some crazy visuals or have some cool experience but it's not it's not uplifting them to the next level they're not unlocking the next chapter or the next they're not you know closing a chapter and entering a new one or they're not you know up leveling their character to use a video game term you know they're not uh yeah they're not reaching the next pinnacle that they should reach and i think in part of the journey our culture especially north american culture struggles with the incorporation piece and then the closing of cycles so we'll like start a bunch of things but then people don't integrate and embody and then kind of come to that that dying that decomposition that closing of a cycle and so going back to the ayahuasca trip it's like people will just keep doing more and more and more but then never integrating the experience where to the point where it's like wow that was a life-changing you know, moment in my life or a vision quest and then, um, and then truly becoming that embodiment and walking that new way. And, uh, yeah, we talk a lot about that in, in what we teach, because it's just, you can be super heady with all of this. And yet if there's no true changes in your path, your life way, who you are, how you show up, then they're all just, you know, you're still distracting yourself, but instead of junk food, you're, you know, it, it's just a different form, but it's more... Uh, same mentality. Yeah, same mentality, but just a different form that's more natural. And I think just being aware of that, because rites of passage are so powerful. I really believe in them. They've changed my life. And So give, give, give us an example of, um, like I can think of one off the top of my head, your experience at teaching from maybe describe how that was a rite of passage for you and uh, how it encompasses, encompasses these different things, it, not just, you know, you went and you paid for the course and you went out there. like. Yeah, so that was an experience that I did pay for. It was through a wilderness school in, in uh, Wisconsin. And I had prepared for a year to go out with a group of roughly 10 to 14 people who we were also preparing for that whole year for a two-month immersion where 
we were completely cut off from society. We had no matches. All of our fires were from friction. We slept in wigwams. We only had natural clothing, so lots of wool because we were also in very cold temperatures. And we were eating, um, you know, a paleo diet the whole time where we didn't necessarily know when our next food drop off was. We were eating a lot of wild food. And um, yeah, it was very intense. Even And that whole journey was a rite of passage. In some ways, every day of that journey was a rite of passage. What are, what are some things, you know, one example, you said it was cold. So yeah, n no comfort regulating in temperature. There was no you know, you, there was no thermostat for you. Like there was no, describe some of the things that, you know, like people might not uh, consider like, you know, that created it as a rite of passage. Well, essentially the rite of passage, that threshold, that liminal has to have discomfort. It has to have in some ways pain or suffering or some form of challenge. And you get to choose in different rites of passage in your life how intense that is and i think you know you would build up to it again a lot of the more intense rite of passage they're offered to adults not children for a particular reason in that situation i would say the intensity the challenge was the cold for sure um you know you're not you have no modern technology you have no matches was definitely a challenge when it was super wet and you're super hungry and you're cooking all your meal over fire you are placed with people who you don't really know and people get triggered so there was a social dynamic that you can't run away when people are reflecting things back to you or the group's not jiving really well and you have to work together to even just make a fire we were tracking uh, deer and wolves every single day. So having these larger scale goals as a group and then trying to make that happen. You also um, had a physical aspect to it as well. Yeah, we were running every single day. And so how do you, you know, create good pack dynamics when you have slower people, stronger people, and really working with that as well. Um, the cold, you know, I ended up even getting some frost uh, frost nip on my body and we had someone in the group who was struggling with his toes and that yeah that's a very real physical challenge food you know you're like so, it was less of that for me but for some people not having their you know whatever they like to eat you know and people who are eating a lot of carbs we had almost zero carbs on that well I guess some fruits but you're not getting your breads, your pastas, and you know your junk food. And for some people, that was really, really hard. Um, yeah, there's a rite of passage of just not being able to talk to your loved ones. I showed up. I didn't know anyone. I mean, I had had some relationship just uh, through email and through kind of group conversations, but I didn't really know anyone going in. So that is also a big step when you're just saying bye for two months. Um, even though I did write letters, that's again, there's like this threshold of intensity and yeah, just the mental aspect of being out there. And we didn't know, I didn't always know what day it was. I was trying to keep track, but it gets tricky. So you get lost in a lot of things, not having running water, not having a shower. There's so many pieces I could go on and on. But the idea here is that there was real challenge and the beauty of rites of passage is that yeah we were a group of 10 to 14 people did leave and you were able to leave too no one's forcing you to do this and so you are every day saying yes to this experience and everybody has their own teachings and so when we hold this space for people going through rites of passage it's you're letting that soul experience this container to then receive their own teachings. Nobody is going to receive the exact same teachings from a rite of passage. We all, you know, had the same experience, same experience, same container, and all left with completely different teachings. And now I'm at the point in my life, would I do that again? Probably not. And I'm not saying, like, I value that experience. I said, yes, I learned so much. I grew, I pushed my edges, but I, integrated what i needed to integrate and now i would still do rites of passages in different ways but now i'm at a different point in my life and so being flexible with it and 
yeah, just enjoying the journey and definitely having people who hold containers for you, especially with rites of passage, just really important. Um, yeah, whether that's, you know, a, a young girl menstruating for the first time and, and having a community to, to welcome her into that part of her life and into that transition or, you know, having men go out in a sweat lodge and coming back and there's a circle of people. There is, it's not something in my opinion that you just do solo. Of course there's exceptions and that you can do that. But a big piece is that, that you're being held before and after and being received differently because it's meant to be it's not meant to be just this like cool thing you do. It's meant to be a real life change. And so I, yeah. I would say that a um, couple pieces that I, I recognize in the story is it's physically difficult. It's mentally difficult. It's emotionally difficult. There's a dick's connection from your um, family comfort. So there's no family members to hold your hand uh, along this, this difficult journey. Um, you're thrust into it. So like you said, the liminal space, the days disappear, all these things, all these things that ground you have kind of been taken away in an effort to dissolve these, these comforts and these normalcies. So to make it more challenging. And also uh, another piece is that um, there's those who came before you. So with many vision quests, like you said, there's a circle to receive you afterwards. No one's asking you to go out and try it for the first time it's not like okay uh bob you get out there and club the black bear over the head you win the vision quest you'll be the first one you know so it's there's a comfort knowing that everyone in the tribe has done it before but a pressure mm -hmm. to know that you know you have to go through it and it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. and then to get to the other side then there's the, the big welcoming committee kind of circle so I guess um, I'll add in my kind of um, thoughts and experience. So Daria had her, her teaching drum experience as a rite of passage. Um, I'll, I'll just pick one for myself that stands out was um, my first kickboxing fight. That was a rite of passage. So, um, you know, you have to train for it. You prepare and it'd be the same for your your rite of passage, Daria had a preparation for it. She didn't just thrust into it. And same with a lot of these uh, indigenous cultures, there was a pre preparatory uh, stage where you build up to this, you know, they're not going to, you know, take you from not walking to running a hundred miles in a day. So um, training for a fight and the skills and learning all this stuff. But once you get in the ring, the coach isn't there to hold your hand. He can't throw the punches or dodge the punches for you. And, you know, um, you have to go through this, you have to go to the end and you have to, to survive the onslaught and, and take the punches and, and deal them out. You have, I had to go through all these things, the fear, the, you know, the seeing all the other people around watching. So it's like going through this thing and that's not very common as well in our, in our, uh, society today. Um, but going through this and then on the other side, you know, the people who've done it before can welcome you in and, you know, but it's, it's not easy. You're no one's there to help you. You could be in a different city You're in front of different people. You don't know, you know, you don't know who this other person is that you're facing. So that for me was a, a type of, um, rite of passage in itself. Uh, you know, I can think of many others and sometimes, uh, we're forced to create those if we can't find them. Mm -hmm. One I ha created for myself at one time because I never had a um, uh, a really extremely challenging solo overnight trip. I uh, decided to go out with no um, tent or sleeping bag in my snowsuit in the middle of winter. And that for me was... Um, creating this thing I was craving of pushing myself to see can I do this can I make it and go hike out for the day with you know no food and see if I could last the night outside by myself would I be scared would I would I give up would I you know be too cold you know all these things that pass through your mind but I knew that I had to do it to 
so I could tell myself that I can overcome, I can survive, I can, you know, uh, you know, just have this, this, I guess, attitude and mental, um, fortitude, mental fortitude, I guess, to, to know that when difficult things come, I could persevere through them. And it was after I did it, it was like a, an upgrade. It wasn't like a just huge epiphany, but it was something that I could say like, okay, I did that. I know I can, I know I'm capable of doing that or more. And I think a common thread that you can hear through our examples and our stories is that there is a level of risk and our culture is not, you know, super adverse, open or accepting of it, but you are, you are in a position where like you could die or there is the possibility of you dying and in or some severe ways, injury. or severe injury. Like most of the time people are just so scared um, of dying, but the, the actual risk of them dying is quite low. They're still in a safe container. And I think it's our culture especially has a hard time with that, but those are oftentimes the richest rite of passage is when you can get to that edge and you meet that edge in your own way. You work through that and then you come back and your ability to live is is far greater because you've faced um, some form of death. It doesn't have to be a physical death, but there's definitely a part of you or some pattern in you that is dying. And um, yeah, that's what creates its potency as a rite of passage. And so like, like Jeff mentioned, either, you know, find mentors or, or containers or experiences that can provide that because now our culture uh, isn't necessarily creating that um, for us or for future generations. You can, and remember that you have that ability to, to act and create these rites of passage. And then also you can do it by yourself. And if you are doing it by yourself, just remember to, yeah, share with other people your journey, your impact, what you're doing, your experience. And so it can still have that uh, aspect of integration and, and having people in your life see you for what you just did. I, I truly believe that it's not meant to be just a solo thing. And um, yeah, so wherever you're at, whatever rite of passage you're curious of, you can, there's so many, yeah, you could learn about them. You can explore some. I would say some that people might not think about, like, you know, the 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 you know the breakup of a relationship you know how do you rebound from that you know like was it a long-term relationship and you know like are you down in the dumps for months well you didn't really you know you didn't receive that rite of passage and move through it very eloquently you know like do you come out the other side better and stronger and like you know more resilient you know is it you know your first piano recital is it you know like it could be these little things that sometimes we overlook as monumental for our character uh, a, a family friend of ours likes to call difficult difficult situations character character building so you know like you know he gave an example of pre preparing a house foundation with concrete and then the forms break and then you know the, the the concrete mixes everywhere and they spend the night shoveling it out well that's kind of like a little mini rite of passage it built his character to deal with this um, disastrous situation. So, you know, it could be um, a, a certain sport, the championship round. It could be, you know, performing in front of a, a group of people on stage. It could be like, there you said, like maybe you buy the house or maybe you, your business fails. How do you, how do you bounce back from that? Or your, your marriage ends, you know, does that tear you down for the next 10 years of your life or do these, these hiccups in your life become uh, stepping stones instead of stumbling stones. So, you know, knowing this, moving forward uh, with the mindset of, okay, how, how do I see these rites of passage in my everyday life? Even though, you know, maybe you're not able to go for 10 days in the forest, but maybe you're like, oh, you know, like my job really sucks. I hate it. And then you want to transition and you try to transition and it fails. Well, you know, does that, does that delay you? Does that set you back? The, you know, you lose your job, you know, like, do you give up? Like seeing these in our everyday situations or seeing these things in life that we don't see as a rite of passage. And then 
having the mindset to be like, oh, snap, this is my rite of passage right now. This is this is my hero's journey to conquer. Like, oh, boy, like this. I just lost my job. OK, how do I come back stronger from this? You know, how do I power through this? Oh, like I lost my home or, you know, whatever it might be, like noticing these rites of passage in our everyday life. If we can't go out and create them or purchase uh, some type of event or, you know, come see someone like us for a vision quest or, you know, some harrowing journey through the mountains and some crazy hike. Like, how do you find that in your everyday life? Because it doesn't just need to be, uh, you know, something you pay money for or, you know, find some elder. There's ways to recreate it for yourself uh, like I did or like Daria has in the past. You know, it doesn't need to just be a course. It could be, you know, a sport. It could be uh, something physical like running. Maybe you run a marathon like you can find it for yourself and create it if, if there's boundaries with money or time or space or whatever. Yeah, you, you can't go through this life without ever experiencing a rite of passage. So just understanding, you know, the dynamics of this, there's going to be some form of separation or severance. So you're going to be saying no and kind of walking away, separating yourself from something, whatever that is. Then you're going to have the threshold, the liminal, that's the the confusion, the, you know, dark night of the soul, the unknown, the what's going on, where's my place, how do I do this, all of those kind of big stirring up questions. And then it will always end with some type of incorporation. So in that, the liminal threshold space, then you're, you're coming in, you're stepping into a new version, the upgrade, the shift, the transition, the new expression of who you are, how you live your life. And so however that rite of passage so shows up, just being aware, you can make your own, you can find your own. There's so many options. So yeah, let us know, mm -hmm. you know, have you done, you know, a rite of passage? What in your life has been a rite of passage that you were maybe aware or not aware of? What can you bring in? Are you being called now for a rite of passage? Are you in the middle of one? Um, for all yeah. my people out there who <laughs> like, you're dealing with a debilitating disease, you have cancer, you have crazy autoimmune disease, you can't get out of bed. Like I've been there. I had cancer. I've had times where I can't move my body or like I've been such like I've been through physical things. And at, at, at an early on time in my life, that was my Mount Everest. That was my uh, hero's journey, my rite of passage. So if you're sick and like you're thinking like, I can't even get out to run, I can't do that this is your rite of passage. If you're mm -hmm. sick, you feel like you're dying, maybe someone's telling you you are dying, this is your rite of passage. So don't think um, just because, you know, there's something in your life that you can't do any of these examples. We said the thing that's holding you back from being able to do those is your rite of passage. So, you know, if you're sick and, and you have some incurable disease or you, you've got cancer, or autoimmune or whatever it might be, some sickness, you were born without legs, whatever it might be, that's your rite of passage. Don't mm -hmm. let anyone convince you that, you know, you got to be on the mountaintop for 10 days fasting or, you know, it's got to be getting a million dollars with your business. It's, it doesn't need to be any of those. It could be the, whatever the hell you're suffering through now and surviving that and making it to the other side to tell someone the story. That could be your rite of passage. Yeah. So enjoy the journey. We're all on one. <laughs> Let us know when you get through the other side and share that story with as many people as possible because you'd be amazed how many lives you changed with some like incredible story about what you did.